So, Robert, first of all, I'd like you to welcome you to our metal radio show, Welcome to Hell, and to our interview session. I'm talking about your new album, Forever Black. So, hello, Robert. <laughs> hello, how are you doing? Fine, thank you. I uh, hope the same to you. When we look back into the history, which started between 1972 and 1976, depends on which source you use. Your band exists for 44 to 48 years. I think a long time with a gap between 1992 and 2015. But would you please guide us into the dungeons of Sirith Angol and tell us a bit about your early history for all the earthlings who never had heard about your band before? Well, uh, I can even correct a, a misconception. I, I When the band got back together, I started, I had some... Uh, some slips of paper where we started writing down some of our first shows that we played together as a band. And uh, actually our first show that we ever did was uh, in 1971. Wow. And so I know that's not a big deal, but I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's something that can, uh, you know, shed some light on when we actually started. Mm -hmm. And I actually have our first show that we played it was February 15th, 1971. Mm -hmm. And it was at a, Right up the street from my house, I could walk there in five minutes. There's a high school, and they had a mini pop festival okay. out in the uh, football stadium. Cool. And people sat on the grass, and it was, you know, it was just like Woodstock, except for all the people. I mean, I think there's maybe a hundred or two hundred people just spread around on the grass, and uh, you know, they, they set up a kind of like a, a crude wooding stage. And I actually have photos from that event, and even a little. Uh, uh, a photograph of the uh, ticket to get in. I think it was free, but it was they handed out little uh, flyers to tell people about it. Cool. So, uh, I mean, that's that's kind of when we started. Now, Tim wasn't singing in the band, but that was, uh, we kind of, uh, the band first started, when we first started uh, playing music, we were in a band called Titanic. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the band wanted to actually play heavier music. And we had a, a buddy of ours at the time, Pat Galligan, Who actually spun off into being in the band uh, the Angry Samoans, a punk band. Oh, they're they're actually you know not I wouldn't say they're not real well known, but probably as well known as our band. And uh, he his family was a, a folk singing family. It was kind of like the Partridge family. The whole band, the whole family was a band. Mm -hmm. And a mom, a dad, a sister, and him, and they all played folk music, and they made a living off of that. And so I mean, he was kind of like. You know, he was more interested in stuff that was more popular type music at the time. And uh, we wanted to, you know, we were discovering, you know, all the stuff that was coming out, you know, the previous years before that and stuff. You know, listening to Mountain, Cream, Jimi Hendrix, you know, all the early heavy music. The um, good old stuff. Yeah, the good old stuff. And uh, so we, we broke away and it formed Sir Thungal. Now, we didn't have a singer for a long time. I can't even, I can't even say for sure when Neil started playing. But we played a bunch of shows with a good friend of ours, Neil Beatty, who was a singer. And he was really, really good performer. And he actually had a really good voice. The only thing was that the direction we were kind of heading in was more like uh, Iggy and the Stooges. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, at the time, you know, we that was another influence of us, the early Iggy stuff. You know, I mean, he was kind of a crazy performer. And our, and our singer, Neil, was like that. Matter of fact, I have a newspaper article from the local newspaper where we're playing down at the beach and it said like, it goes something like, you know, part of the day's uh, excitement was when Sir Thungle singer, Neil Beatty threatened to disrobe on stage. <laughs> and uh, that never happened. But I mean, I thought, just thought it was kind of a funny, uh, funny interlude. But anyway, to make, make that story short, after a while we played with Neil and he was a good friend of ours and stuff. But, you know, around this time, you know, Black Sabbath, and the early Deep Purple and all that stuff was happening. And then we actually, you know, that's where we wanted to head. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, and when I say we, I'm saying, you know, Greg, Jerry, and me, mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to head in a more darker direction. So we played for a while, actually, without a singer. And we actually played a bunch of shows in L.A. at, at uh, venues you would have never imagined that would allow a band like that play. Like we played at the Starwood and the Whiskey Go-Go cool. uh, as a three-piece instrumental. Mm-hmm. And then at the time, uh, Tim was one of our buddies. Uh, his brother was one of our roadies, and Tim would sometimes 
he had a little bit more skill at it. So he'd like, you know, he'd work the mixing console or do the sound for the band. And I'm not sure how it came about, but, you know, his brother or someone, Dan goes, hey, you know, Tim can sing. You should have him try out. And, you know, I remember we did just one recording and it was so we were so excited with it that uh, we decided, hey, let's, uh, you know, let, let, let's do this because his voice was very unique. Definitely. And, uh, yeah. and so anyway, so that went on uh, for a while. And, you know, we graduated from high school. Uh, we tried to practice at a bunch of our parents' houses and every single one got thrown out. But at my parents' house, kind of up on uh, in a canyon up on the hillside, there wasn't all that many neighbors. It was just like one street with houses going up on either side of the street. Okay. And my sister got married and moved out. So the band moved into her old bedroom <laughs> and we rigged up a thing, a piece of plywood wrapped in carpet. We'd stick in the uh, window and we would practice there. And, you know, a lot of the neighbors were really upset with that. But the good news was my sister married the guy next door. So his family lived right on the side where our band room was, where it was probably the noisiest. And since they couldn't really complain because they were like part of our family. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy. And so we would get there and we started, we were there for a long time. We were there for, uh, I would say, five to eight years, maybe even longer. Wow. So probably from around 1973 to around 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we played in uh, my parents' house. And what was kind of cool, my dad would be working. And, you know, we'd all either be going to school or college or whatever we were doing, working small jobs. And so we'd meet at my parents' house at around 5 o'clock every night, 4 or 5 o'clock, and we'd practice. And maybe a little bit early, maybe it was 3 o'clock or something, and we'd practice, and we'd always practice for around an hour or so. And so that was kind of our compact the deal we made with all the neighbors. Like, you know, you hate our band, we're really loud, mm -hmm. but we're only going to play an hour, that is like cool. three or four days a week. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind that, you know, you know, we'll start playing every day, you know. And so anyway, I think they kind of, after a while, they got used to it. Now, what's amazing, I don't think that could go on today. Because uh, we walked down the street the other day, you know, everyone's in kind of locked lockdown mode. And there's a guy tapping on his drums in a house, you know, very lightly. And you could hear it, you know, three houses down, you know, and you can imagine, you know, we had like a lot of amplification in my drum set. And all we had was like a little board in the window. And, you know, obviously I, I could never go outside and hear our band play while I was playing. But I, I was outside, you know, listening to the guitarist and Tim and guys warm up in there and it was it was very loud <laughs> so the push was on even then was hey look you know we're getting more amplifiers we're getting louder we had to find a band room mm -hmm. so after we released our first album Frost and Fire uh, we actually uh, and I'm, I'm leaving a little bit out I, I don't know how, how far in detail do you want me to go but about that time that Tim started in the band, we, we started sending out demos trying to get record company uh, support or get a record company contract. Because mm -hmm. if you weren't on a record company, you weren't on a radio, you know, there was no way forward for a band. Mm -hmm. And so we decided to send out a bunch of cassettes. So we sent out all sorts of cassettes to record companies, never heard nothing back. Fast forward around a year later or so, we, we started getting uh, discouraged. And so we we go, what can we do to get these guys' attention? And so we decide that we are going to produce a demo that was like the mother of all demos. So we decided, okay, if we're going to do this right, we're going to make a 12-inch LP demo. It's going to have fantastic cover art, good photography. I was a graphic artist, so I laid out all the uh, the layout and design of the album. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a good friend who was a photographer that... Uh, took our first promo shot so he took he took the photos uh his name was w uh, wallace rollins and he was kind of like a famous uh, photographer but he was more like doing stuff like uh you know I, I would think i think he was doing even though he did a lot of people he did a lot of landscapes and nature and stuff like that okay mm -hmm. but if i'm not mistaken he was you know he was he did it for you know he was like a well-known photographer at the time and i had a friend that actually uh was married to him at one time and she said well you know if you need some photos you know call my ex-husband wally he could do it so he took the first fo promo shots of the band and i think you'll see the, the bouncing around from time to time and then he took the back cover of the album and uh, uh, the the inner sleeve the lyric sheet that slipped into the album he took those photos too so okay so we we're thinking okay we're going to put out this demo but, you know, we needed some money. And at the time, we had a good friend, uh, Randall L. Jackson, and he was a good buddy of ours. And he'd actually been in an oil field accident. He was out in the middle of the ocean on a ship, and they were trying to transfer him from one ship to another, kind of via zip line. Mm -hmm. 
and uh you know in the in the the naval terminology that's zip line is not what they use i forget what they called it but when they try to get one person from one ship to another they stretch out a cable and a person slides over there on what we would call a zip line today mm -hmm. Anyway, it was unsuccessful, and he fell and hit the deck and broke his back, and he actually got quite a bit of money, and so he actually loaned us <clears throat> the money, which we paid him back, of course, to actually pay for all uh, the production of the album. That kind of takes us up to where Frost and Fire was, and uh, there's another part to that, too, I got to put in, because it, it's actually before that. There wasn't that many places we could play like heavy metal back then, and in our town, They'd always have like surf stomps or dances where they try to get bands together to get all the uh, the surfers and their girlfriends together out to go dance to them, right? And we really didn't play dance music. <laughs> so about every year, one of the local radio stations would put on a battle of the bands. And so the bands would fight it out over like, you know, sometimes it was one or two shows. Other times, I think one year, they had like five or six shows like at different clubs mm -hmm. or National Guard Armory, like, you know, kind of larger places where you could fit more people. Mm -hmm. And one year we actually came in second and the prize was $500 recording at this local studio, Goldmine Recording Studio. Cool. So we used that $500 along with uh, our buddy Randy who loaned us some money to actually record Frost and Fire and put it out as an album. And when we did that, uh, once again, I did the layout. We got the photography from... Uh, Wally mm -hmm. and we're looking for an album cover and we kind of settled on a Frank Frazetta painting you know we hadn't contacted him but we've settled on this painting that we're going to try to get him to let us use right and uh right at this very time uh, Molly Hatchet came out with an album with this uh, Frank Frazetta painting Berserker mm -hmm. on the cover mm -hmm. and we're like how can this be because Molly Hatchet you know a lot of times people say oh Sarah Thunder your music doesn't really fit the album covers But Molly Hatch was more like a southern rock band. And so to have kind of like a barbarian on the cover of their album seemed really strange to us. So at the time, I was reading a book by Michael Moorcock, Stormbringer, which Greg had, le had lent me. And I looked down at it and I said, oh, my goodness, uh, this album cover is probably the most amazing painting I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is even better, obviously, than the one that we wanted. And, and I'm not I love Frank Frazetta and I love all the Conan uh, stuff he did. Uh, the Dust album, you know, all those paintings are just fantastic. And and if Michael Whalen hadn't have showed up, that would have been probably the direction we would have tried to go in. But I'm looking at this uh, book cover, and we all agreed that, hey, this would be the best cover ever. And so I wrote uh, the company Daw Books that put out that series of Elric uh, books at the time, and I think there might have been the first ones released in the United States. And they put me in touch with Michael Whalen, And I contacted him and I, you know, I sent him, you know, the music on a cassette tape or something. And we agreed to let us, he, he agreed to let us use uh, his painting, which is called uh, Stormbringer. Fantastic. On our, yeah. yeah, on our first album. Very, very great. Uh, and the rest is history. So I think we continue with the questions, but it's, it's really, really impressive uh, how the first steps were. But um, why did you choose the path of the spider as a name for the band? Are you all Lord of the Rings maniacs, or how does it come? Well, you know, a lot of people, someone asked me in a recent interview, like, you know, wow, you guys are so influenced by Lord of the Rings, and it's like it's a compass that directs our lives. Well, not right now, but back when we first started, Greg and I met in a, kind of like an advanced English class for kids that are smarter than the regular kids. You know, they they kind of separate you out in school. Like, I think they did IQ test or something, and I don't know if you if you could read, Uh, they, they put you in a class where you could read more stuff, right? <laughs> so we were in this literature class, and they assigned us to read The Lord of the Rings. And that's another joke, because back in at the time, that no one had heard of this. There was no movies. There was nothing, right? Mm. And so we're reading Lord of the Rings, and it's a three-volume book, each one about the size of War and Peace. If you think of it nowadays, you know, it's it's just impos it's impossible. It's, it's not like easy reading. So, I mean... Not that many people were reading The Lord of the Rings back in the day. Yeah. We'd never heard of it. We were assigned to read it, and we read it, and it had quite of a, an effect on us because there's a whole, you know, there's a whole hierarchy of like, you know, elves and goblins and orcs yeah. and uh, a new world and so on. Yeah, exactly. And so it, it had a really, really good influence on us. And we were trying to find a name for our band, and we had, to, you know, we had two or three. I think one was Nazgul. You know, those were like the 
yeah. evil. Uh, I know that the masculines, yeah. Yeah, that were flying around and stuff. So we had, uh, you know, we had a couple of different names we were trying to choose from, and we picked that. Now, I've joked also too, you know, you know, I wish, you know, in retrospect, I wish we'd have picked a one syllable thing like, you know, the Who or Kiss or, you know, uh, Thrust or, you know, Triumph. You know, I mean, anything other than, you know, like, uh, you know, something that was. Uh, you know, hard to pronounce. Yeah. And, and when Frost and Fire came out, you know, the whole cover is green. Someone said, oh my God, a green album's never sell. <laughs> and, you know, we were joking, well, you know, ZZ Top's had a thing, uh, Trace Ombre is, and that sold really well. But I mean, that's neither here nor there. So uh, the point is, we were all really, you know, me, Jerry, and uh, Greg all read that. Now, once again, fast forward like almost 50 years later right you know it's like is it a big influence on us now probably not but i mean it still sticks with us i mean when i'm flipping around on the news channels uh and it's one of the lord of the rings movies is on i will watch it and that goes back to another thing you mentioned it before we put out our first album we're like hey how can we use this without getting in trouble because this is someone else's copyrighted material mm -hmm. so we contacted a company at the time that owned the rights to it and this is another thing most people don't really realize. The first Lord of the Rings, uh, I think it was either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, was put out as a cartoon in the United States. And so a company uh, bought the, it was a big Hollywood company, but they bought the rights from uh, J.R. Tolkien to actually put out you know this first movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure later on it was sold to Peter Jackson or who knows. But I mean, we wrote the company and asked him if we could have permission to use a name. And he sent us back a letter saying, sure. But, you know, you know, just let us know what you're doing, you know, and they said, you know, we can't do anything too crazy because we don't want, you know, we can't, uh, you know, they didn't want to like have anything that would, uh, <laughs> it wouldn't draw would, would be stick together with, to, yeah, <laughs> yeah to draw disrepute to the name. And I assume they were thinking of something either illegal or like pornographic or what have you. So. Funny thing. Okay. Um, let's come to a bit later period between 1992 and 2015. There was nothing. But then came a young guy from Ventura called Jarvis Leatherby, and he awoke the band to rise from the ashes. Tell us a little bit about his role in coming together for the second time. Well, I had a buddy, another, you know, there's a big punk population around here. You know, I mean, there's a lot of guys that do a lot of different kinds of music. The unfortunate part is it's not like Europe where there's enough to actually had big shows and stuff, but there was a big punk community here and in the local city next to us, Oxnard, California. Mm -hmm. uh, they call it Nardcore, whatever. And I think Jarvis was even uh, involved in actually putting on some shows, a festival of like all punk bands. So anyway, I had a buddy that I knew, and he was a drummer in this punk band called Ill Repute. His name was Carl Valdez. And he goes, hey, I got this buddy, Jarvis, and he just uh, travels around Europe in his band Night Demon, and he's been seen a bunch of Sirithungal fans and stuff and he said you know we're from the same town he goes he wants to meet and talk with you and you know i, I was still kind of bitter about the band and i i'd done a bunch of interviews with big magazines like sweden rocks or other magazines in europe where they did uh you know giant maybe four or five page full color spreads with old pictures of the albums and stuff like that And the reason i did that was kind of trying to keep the band's name alive but yeah. You know, Carl mentioned, he goes, hey, you know, I think Jarvis wants, he thinks you guys should get back together. And, and I just, you know, it was never going to happen, right? So uh, I met with him. At first, I didn't want to. But then, you know, Carl kept bugging me. Hey, we'll just talk to him and see what he wants, you know. So we met. And uh, he was saying, you know, he'd tell me all these crazy stories. He goes, you know, we're traveling all over Europe. And he goes, people will show up with homemade Sirithungal shirts or, or they'll... Uh, we'll be in Zurich, Switzerland at a bar playing and they'll play Frost and Fire in between bands. And he goes, if you guys got back together, I think that uh, people would like to hear you. And I'm just like, you know what? I wish we could, you know, but I go, we're older now. Rock's a young man's game. And I said, you know, you know, we tried this once before, you know, even though we loved our music, we thought it was really good. Obviously, we didn't think no one else liked it, right? So, you know, I, I just kept telling people no, you know, and I'd sold my drum set. None of the guys, some of the guys we weren't even in touch with anymore. So that's how that kind of went. And he goes, well, look, he goes, I'm putting on a local festival here because, you know, Jarvis had ambitions, you know, well, other than being in just one band, he wanted to be like a promoter and a manager and stuff. So he goes, I'm, I'm going to put on a festival here in our hometown. Mm -hmm. It's such a beautiful place. 
even though there's not a lot of metal heads uh, locally, I mean, there's a few, but there's not a lot. He goes, I'm going to put on a festival and people come from all over the world to see bands I'm bringing in from all over the world. And we said, well, that's cool. And he goes, well, look, I'm going to name it Frost and Fire after your first album, you know, as a dedication to, you know, to you guys being, you know, one of the local heavy metal guys that, you know, one of the, some of the first guys in our local area. He goes like this. He goes, I'm going to put on this festival and uh, would you guys like to do a signing session at it? You know, and, and I'm thinking, you know, well, that's cool. I mean, what would that hurt? So we contacted all the other guys that were kind of in the band. Uh, they were still around. And everyone that was interested said, okay, we'll do it. So he had a fantastic festival Friday, Saturday. It's all sold out stuff. People came from all over the world. And on Sunday, they had like a few bands playing like in a, a smaller bar mm -hmm. in an outside porch area. And so they set up some tables. And we sat down to sign autographs. And there were just like a giant string of people. Uh, that brought albums and wanted to meet the band and it was it was we were kind of blown away just how many people actually especially younger people i mean people that weren't born until after the band actually broke up in yeah. 1990 so that's how this <clears throat> the beginning of this started at the same time oliver from keep it true came out to his festival and uh oliver had been contacting me since uh, i think his first keep it true you know he I think I have an email going back to 2003 where he's going, hey, man, get back together, come play our show. And I'm just like, you know, very friendly, but no, I don't think it's never going to happen. And he would even say, hey, come on, I'll fly you out, come check it out just to see what it's like. And I'm like, no, that that doesn't seem right. You know, I'm not going to have you fly me all the way around the world. I've never been to Europe anyway, uh, just to come see something that we're never going to play at. Anyway, so well, Oliver was at this uh, signing session, too. You know, Oliver wants to talk to everyone across the street. So we went across the street to a bar and uh, we're sitting there and Jarvis goes, hey, what did you think of the festival? And we're like, oh, that was fantastic. And he goes, I'm going to do another one next year. And if you guys want to, you guys can uh, headline it. Cool. And, you know, so we're thinking of that. They're going, well, that's kind of cool. And then uh, Oliver goes, he goes, hey, he goes, I, I can offer you a similar deal. He goes, if you guys get back together, he goes, I'm booked for this year's Keep It True, but he goes, you guys can headline my next year's Keep It True, and he goes, I, I'll fly, you know, you and Tim out this year just to come check it out and see what you think, see if you want to be a part of this, right? Mm -hmm. And so the whole band kind of, you know, this kind of blew us away, you know, something that we never ever considered rejoining, and so we actually uh, uh, we thought about it, you know, Tim and I flew out and checked out the Keep It True thing, which was uh, beyond belief. And we did a giant signing session there, which was so long. Like each band does around an hour signing session. And we did one that stretched around two or three bands uh, off to the side. They kept having to move us off to a corner. So the, the band that was supposed to do their signing session would do it. And so that, that was, we came back from that. And I think the band just decided, hey, look, we're getting older. If we're going to ever do this, let's do this now. We wrote some really good music. We're very proud of it, and obviously a newer generation wants to hear it, so let's get together and play. And Jarvis said, if you guys do this, he goes, I'll manage a band. I know you guys never had anyone knew what they were doing as a manager, which is totally true. And uh, so that's how that that's how Jarvis, uh, the role is. And, you know, it's it's the truth. Without Jarvis, we would not be back together again. Oh, so it's very cool that he does this job. So let's come to the album. Um, when did the idea of writing a new album took place? What does or, or when does the creative process started for that? As soon as the band got back together, we started playing and writing new material. And that's uh, you know, a lot of people are like, they're amazed by that. But I mean, that's what, you know, if you're a musician, that's what you do. You, especially in a band like us, like we hardly ever played covers. Every once in a while we'd play a cover by a band like by Budgie or, uh, you know, Thin Lizzy or something, but we do that more as fun, like warming up or just, you know, before we practiced our own material, we just played that just because the band that we really liked. We never really did it that seriously. We just did it, you know, kind of something to do. <clears throat> so we're a band that, you know, we were a band that really only existed to write, you know, Sir Thungle songs, right? So uh, as soon as we got back together, you know, the first thing, as soon as we had a band room, it was kind of hard. For a while, uh, Night Demon was so kind to let us, you know, use their little practice space. Dusty Squires let me use his drum set. You know, I mean, it's just uh, amazingly cool what they did. <clears throat> yeah. 
we're looking around, and it turns out Goldmine Studios, where uh, we recorded the majority of all our uh, records at that time, I drive by it every day on the way to the Night Demon uh, band room. And I never saw any cars there, so I contacted Jeff, the owner, and he'd been on tour the last several years. He was making more money touring around, uh, doing sound for big bands, uh, okay. like Joe Bonamassa, guys like that. Uh, you know, really big production stuff. And so his studio was kind of sitting empty. And so uh, he had a giant room in there, and we only needed a little portion just to set up all our equipment. So he rented us like a little area of one of the rooms where we... I recorded my drums for Paradise Lost It. Mm -hmm. And that went on for, you know, over a year. And it was just perfect. But what happened was, is, uh, everyone's so greedy around this area, the people raised his rent so much. After being over 40 years as a studio, he had to actually uh, just move out. And he left the state, moved back to uh, Tennessee, I think. And anyway, the studio was torn down. And it was a really tragedy because a lot of famous people recorded there. Uh, Katy Perry, you know, she's a famous pop star. Oh, I know. She recorded her first song there as a child. Okay. Uh, <laughs> some uh, cowboy guys here in the United States, Roy Rogers and Dale Evans. Uh, you know, he was a guy, he was like a TV cowboy. Uh, they recorded some stuff there. And there was a lot lot more bands that are probably more famous, but the guys that, that's the two people that stick out in my mind. Anyway, I drive by there every day as they're tearing it down, and it was just a... It was just horrible watching it. It'd be like watching, you know, the house you grew up in being torn down. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, so now it's an auto, uh, auto, uh, what do you call it, repair shop, which is just like a travesty. Oh, okay. But anyway, as soon, as soon as we finally got a band room, which was there, you know, we could play as loud as we wanted to, day or night. <clears throat> Anything we wanted to do, we could do. So as soon as we moved in there, we started working on new material. Along the time, uh, along this time, you know, we're playing all our shows and we're practicing and uh, Tim sees online that there's a movie coming out, an animated movie called The Planet of Doom. And uh, it kind of got us excited because we had a song on our third album, One Foot in Hell, called Doom Planet, uh, which I wrote the lyrics to. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of about what's happening right now. You know, it's kind of like, you know, a planet, you know, on a, the decline. And so we were all excited about that. And the band contacted them and they agreed to... Uh, to let us uh, use, you know, our song Doom Planted on the closing credits of the movie. Great. And the, mo the movie consists of like 15 artists with 15 bands, and there's no dialogue in the movie. It's just an animated movie with all sorts of really, you know, cool music and cool animation. And we were like, wow, I wish we could have, you know, been there earlier on on the ground floor. Maybe we could have wrote a song for the movie. And he said, well, you know, it's we're all everything's all booked up but we're really looking forward to using you know uh, doom planet for the credit ending credits which i thought was kind of cool mm -hmm. and so uh, not too long after that we got uh jarvis got a contact from uh, one of the producers and they said hey look one of the bands dropped out for one reason or another and so if you guys want to write a song for the movie you can and we were working on another song at the time we it was called leather wings and it kind of was kind of a uh a doomy kind of a song that sounded like something that they were looking for for the movie mm -hmm. but you know we, they needed a certain link and they needed uh, the song each song tells a story of what's happening in the movie since there's no dialogue right yeah. and so tim got together with the producers and he completely rewrote all the lyrics and we sat down and we rewrote the song completely i mean i think we used maybe one or two riffs out of it uh, but we rewrote the whole song into which is game Oh. And uh, that was decided uh, we were going to release that as a single on Metal Blade, a very limited edition single. There's only a thousand of them put out. So when that came out, you know, there was a lot of reviews on the single. And, you know, almost every review said, wow, I can't believe these guys can still play or write music, which surprised us pretty amazingly. Uh, and also people are saying, well, you know, hey, this is great, you know looks like these guys can still you know write songs and they can still play their instruments and and uh we wish that they had another full length album coming and it wasn't just one but almost everyone who viewed it said you know boy hope that there's something more coming after that so i think that was a green light for us to uh decide hey if if there's a market for this you know you know we have a whole string of songs we're working on we'll put out a record about the time though we had a uh, 
we made an arrangement early on when we got back together to do a live album. Metal Blade asked us whether we wanted to do one, and you know we'd never done one before, and we thought this was perfect. And so our live album was coming out at the end of the year. And so what we didn't want to do, we didn't want to step on that release because it was, seemed so important to the band. So we just slowly started working on the material and recording it, you know, which would, for now, you know, as you know, is Forever Black, which is coming out on Friday. Yeah. Okay, so it's time for Forever Black, the fifth studio album in your career. In my opinion, a great follow-up to Paradise Lost, your last album in 1991. I think in every minute of the 39 minutes lasting CD, The listeners can feel the spirit of the band and your history. The album was recorded at the Captain's Quarter Studio by Night Demon guitarist Armand. Uh, was this a logical decision because he's a close friend, a roadie and technician of the band? Or why did you decide to give the work in his hands? Uh, by the way, he did a great job and the record has a fantastic old school spirit. You know, the first choice would have probably been Goldmine because that's where we recorded all the other albums. Mm -hmm. And only because we had such a familiarity with that studio, but with, with and that was even Jarvis. You know, I, I talked to Jarvis at length about this. He's all like, he goes, "Man, Rob, he goes, I had some real plans, you know, for you guys, you know, working in your old studio." But you know, after that was torn down, that wasn't to be. And you know, Armand has a great studio. He's put out some really cool stuff right next to our band room. Yeah. He's one of our very best friends. He knows the band inside and out. When we played at Rock Hard in Gelsenkirchen, uh, Germany, yes. uh, Greg, he had a family member uh, that was really ill and he couldn't leave town. And so Armand, you know, who's a fantastic guitarist, he sat in for Greg on a couple of shows. And so, I mean, he knows the band's music backwards and forwards. Uh, like I said, he's one of our very best friends in the world. And so it just seemed like a perfect choice, you know? You know, after explaining all that right there, I think anyone would realize, yeah, that, that would be the perfect choice, you know? I mean, so we recorded everything in there and uh, mixed it down. I have to say, you know, when you're so close to a project, you know, that's all you're thinking about. I mean, I've been listening to that music for the last year, probably straight. You know, every time I drive around in my car, I'm listening to the new music, getting ready to play it live at Keep It True Friday, which was canceled, unfortunately. But, yeah. you know, We've been hearing it so much and listening to. We're so close to it. You know, it's like it's hard to be. Uh, it's 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 hard to be objective about something that you've been so close to involved with. And so, last couple of weeks, actually taking a little bit of time off from the band, just trying to stay at home, do all that stuff. But also, you know, kind of just trying to recharge yourself. You know, everyone needs a break from something. Yeah. Uh, and so, yesterday, I got I got my first uh, copy of the album in a CD. Oh wow! And, uh, first, I'm looking at it, and I'm like, oh yeah, you know, it's our new album. And then I actually, it's sitting over there in the corner and I'm doing some stuff, working in the yard, what have you. And I come in and take a shower and I've been thinking about the album this whole time. So I go over there, you know, with my fingernail, just like I used to back in the day, I slit the plastic off there and I open it up and I was blown away. And a matter of fact, it, it took a while, I think, for it to sink in. After all these years, we have a new album out. And I'm not, I'm not, no way am I degrading what we did with Witch's Game or the live album, but to have a, a whole totally new studio album out, the cover is fantastic. And Metal Blade, even instead of some shiny, glossy thing that would have totally not fit the uh, artwork, it's like kind of like a rough, soft, kind of a dry looking cover, which just fits perfectly the painting, which is actually such a small painting. You can actually see some of the canvas in the background. So, I mean, the whole execution on how it was uh, put out and uh, produced and packaged and everything, it just is it so beautiful. I mean, it almost brought me to tears. Matter of fact, I'm kind of getting emotional right now because, once again, this was such a big moment for us, you know. You know, and, and people keep saying, well, did you ever think you would do it? And the answer is no. Did, do you think people would like it? You know, and we never, we never wrote music expecting people to like it. We just wrote the heaviest music that we could. And I, I always tell everyone the same thing. You know, our goal is to write super heavy music. I'm going to let you or the listener be the judge, but we're trying to write it for ourselves. Are we satisfied? No, we're never satisfied. We always wish it was this was heavier or that was listening to the album and looking at it and holding it in my hand. I'm very proud of what we did. Uh, and this is definitely okay. So it's, it's a fantastic album. Uh, I like it very much and I like the songs. I heard it about 10 times in the last days and uh, it was really really great 
And the sound is really great. A bit old school, a bit feeling that it has really been released in the late 80s or first 90s. Um, it's uh, everything is the, the mixture is really really good, and um, I think I like the most uh, the song before tomorrow. It's a great song about the end that is near. A song that could not match better to this current time with the coronavirus and the conspiracy theories and all that shit that's going on. What is your feelings about this song and about the time that this song was released in? Tim's been writing a bunch of dystopian lyrics for a while now. Not not only uh, since the band got back together, but I think even you know during the break or before we broke up, you know, he wrote the trilogy on Paradise Lost, and so that's kind of his style. And so when we were doing this album, you know, the plan was, you know, we wanted something really heavy, but we also saw what the direction it was heading in. It was going to be kind of dark. You know, it, it has uh, a couple of songs, uh, Frostbond Stream and Fire Divine. Greg wrote the lyrics to that. And that's more of like a fantasy based topic back to uh, kind of nod back to Frost and Fire. Mm. And of course, I wrote Legions Arise, and that was supposed to be a call to arms, kind of like part two of Join the Legion. <laughs> yes. Uh, but uh, t Tim, you know, Tim's focused on all this dystopian nightmare stuff. And that's that's where that song comes from. And that's where the majority of the album is. Now, unfortunately, real events, as we're sitting here talking, are mirroring what's in our album. And that's good and bad because it, it actually draws significance to what we were writing about. And I don't want to downplay all the horrible tragedy that's going on around the world because, you know, many people are, are suffering right now or dying. And I, I don't want to take anything away from that, but this right now is probably the biggest time of our band, you know, with uh, the new album coming out and a bunch of the shows, large shows we were going to play in Europe. And so this, even though our music was prophetic, this couldn't have come as a worse time for us because we wanted to get out and showcase this album. Mm. And now it's an impossibility. But the song you mentioned before tomorrow, you're spot on, you know? I mean, that's, we're here. It's actually, you know... We're not before tomorrow, we're actually at tomorrow, I think. Yeah, you're right. I think Forever Black ends with the title track, an epic Doom track with an awesome solo and a lyrical message that comes directly from the band. Or what do you want to say? Are you Forever Black or what is Forever Black, in your opinion? Well, you know, that was, once again, that was one of Tim's songs. Ah, it's okay. And, uh, it's same, same style. Yeah, and, you know, matter of fact, everyone keeps, you know, I've done 100 interviews right now, and mainly because Tim's, you know, busy with his career and all the stuff he's doing, so, and I think I talk the most, so they stick me out there, uh, you know, to say to say all this stuff, but I mean, this is all, you know, I talk to the band about everything that I say, so to make sure that, I, you know, I'm giving the correct answers, and I ask Tim, you know, people say, you know, what's this song about, or what's that song about, so I'll talk to Tim. And not only that, you know, when we were writing these songs, you know, we'd all be reading them and we'd be analyzing them and trying to, like, think of what it really means, right? And so what Tim always says, though, he says, you know, if I asked him, I said, hey, Tim, well, what's Forever Black? You know, well, what does this mean to you? And he goes, read the damn lyrics. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I guess that's uh, what he would say. But the, the honest truth is we, when we were writing these songs and we could see the direction that they were headed, we saw it being dark and foreboding and brooding yeah. and uh and that's where we were headed and so i mean it was like only natural i mean there was some question of band what you know should we really call this forever black you know and i can't speak for everyone else but i know me and tim were all like yeah hell yeah because that's this is it's a very dark album it's going to be really you know it's the world's declining you know it's the environment's declining you know people Uh, the environment, everything around us is falling apart, right? And so Forever Black seemed like the perfect title track for the album. Also, too, at the time, we were looking for a cover, something to fit that, right? You know, and the the several paintings by Michael Whalen out of that series of books that, you know, we decided, hey, if we have a choice in our life to do albums, we want his work on our albums, right? Yeah. The several paintings, they they were kind of like more colorful or they had... A different feeling to him and then tim shows up one day 
you know, should send me an email or something and says or a message and he goes, look at this Elric picture. It was kind of an unknown one of Michael Whalen. So, I mean, I'm like, I go, I think Michael Whalen did. And then I think he said, no, I don't think so. It's some other guy. But, I, but it turned out it was one of Michael Whalen's more obscure paintings that he did. It wasn't a large scale painting. It was a small one. It was only like maybe nine inches by 12. Oh, okay. And I'm, you can convert that into centimeters for your listeners. But it was a small painting which he actually painted as a study and actually sold at a, a, a at like a comic convention. A gentleman somewhere here in the United States owns the uh, original. But as always, Michael Whalen, part of his thing is, you know, he wants to always retain uh, the rights to use his paintings. And so he allowed us to use that on this album. And we just think it's just the perfect complimentary artwork because it shows Elric, but it shows him in this kind of a, a dark uh, mood. And uh, the name of the painting is Elric in Exile. Yeah. But we were talking to Michael Whalen, and he sent us the first high-res picture. It was called Elric in the Wasteland. And I'm not sure maybe that was his nickname for it or whatever. But once again, the the names of the picture, the, the mood of the picture, and the mood of the album just seemed to fit perfectly. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. Uh, so let's come to two small things. Um, the first one, I think you will uh, have to answer this in all your interviews, um, the song Stormbringer, which features a new kind of clear voice from Tim. Um, was that planned uh, to try a new voice color into his singing or how does it come? Well, you know, uh, uh, on Paradise Lost, uh, Bob, when we started off the trilogy, Bob sings a little bit on uh, Chaos Rising, more like a natural singing voice. And I think, you know, on Starbringer was our first ballad. And we talked about this, you know, we were, you know, other people said, you know, I should Jarvis sing this part or whatever. And Tim goes, hey, I got this, you know, I'm the singer of the band. I can take, I can take care of this. And so it, it was just a little bit of different flavor, just showing, you know, a different voice of his, you know, if he wants to use that voice. So, I mean, that, that was kind of planned from the beginning. And once again, we weren't sure who was going to really sing it. But, you know, Tim sang it. And I think it fits, uh, you know, perfectly. You know, everyone has, this is a band, we're not necessarily monotone. You know, we aren't just one color, black or white. But, well, actually, for and for this album, we're, we're forever black. But I, I think it's just showing a different side of Tim's uh, talent. Definitely. And um, the other thing that I want to mention is, the great drum beat and the chorus of the Frostman's Dream. Um, tell us a bit about this special drumming because it sounds really great when you, I think you, you hit the toms there and it, it sounds like you were walking from one etage to another one. So it's really, really cool. Yeah, you know, that's weird. It comes into my drumming style, you know, and I taught myself to play drums and, you know, I know I don't have a lot of fans for my drumming and uh, I'll never be a nail pur or anyone like that. But <laughs> I really believe this. I would say, you know, my my style, my, my drum is 95% style and 5% technical ability, and I'm fine with that, and I'll tell you why. Uh, you can go on the internet, and you can pick any of your favorite musicians in the world, and you can just go down the list of what singer, guitarist, drummer, what have you, and you'll find a girl in Thailand or a boy in South America who's five that can play guitar better or sing better, play drums in any of your favorite great But what they lack is they lack a, a style. And what I think I have an abundance of, maybe I, I'm not a great drummer, but I have great style. And I think what you're what you're hearing on Frostmon Stream is once again, is my drumming style coming across. What I try to do, all of my favorite drummers have been amazing drummers, but what I really love is I love drummers that can actually play like not just right with the band, but they can create like another uh, a layer of uh, texture around the music and that's what i'm trying to do in a lot of these songs that's kind of where that came from you know i hear the music and every song that we play i hear the music and i hear like a specific drum beat or a drum feel in the background mm -hmm. and a lot of times even the guys in the band are all oh, that's horrible or, that shouldn't go there uh, and i think later on you know the proof is in the in the, the pudding and i think uh i'm really proud of the drums i did on on the album you know and, and that song in particular Yeah, okay, wonderful. Good good that we talked about it because it's it's really fascinating to hear that because you, you've done that uh, in uh, in the earlier times also and uh, when I heard that, I thought, ah, okay, I heard that before. It's typical Robert. Yeah, I have another drum story. 
I've been recently reading, there's a gentleman in New Zealand, uh, Chris Pike, who wrote a series of uh, biographies about the band Budgie, which was one of our band's early influence. Mm-hmm. We loved them, you know. Uh, some of their music is just so heavy. You know, it's not just us, a bunch of other bands, Metallica, what have you, a lot of other bands, you know, were influenced by them early on. And uh, I've been in contact with the drummer, Ray Phillips, and it, he was also one of my, you know, he's another one of those drummers that just has a bunch of, of style, you know, whether it's John Bonham or him or Corky Lang from Mountain, you know, or Bill Ward, Ian Pace, or these guys that have this very unique, I mean, you can just hear the drumming and know who the drummer is based on the style. Mm-hmm. And so I, I've always loved Ray Phillips' drumming, and uh, we're working on uh, Fractus Permissum, and uh, I told him, I said, look, I go, one of your favorite songs on one of your albums, Squawk, uh, Whiskey River, had this really cool double bass drum beat with a cowbell in it. And I just, uh, I go, I'm going to put a, a, a drum beat in one of our songs as a nod back to my your influence on me and also just to show, you know, how much I'm grateful to some of these drummers that actually gave me so much uh, in the way of influence. And so on, on the Fractus, our song, it's like uh, on the main on the main verses, I have this drum beat I put in there. And uh, that brings up another thing. I'm, I'm a cowbell guy. If you ever look at some of my first pictures of me playing drums, yeah. I'll always have a cowbell on the yeah. drum set. That's right, yeah. And it, I and heard it. In, yeah, and the joke is amongst the band is like, you know, how they can keep me away from the cowbell as much as possible. So. <laughs> Uh, but, but they they were good this time. I think I heard it just one, two times, and uh, very short times. Yeah, it's in uh, Frostbound Stream, and it's in uh, Fractus. It's only two times the cowbells on there. So I think that <laughs> going forward, you know, the band has a thing, like maybe only one or two cowbell parts per album or something. <laughs> the guys did a good job. <laughs> okay. I want, to, oh, I want to reach out to all the band members. I want to thank them for allowing me to do that, because somewhere down in me... I think Christopher that, Walk and more cowbell thing going on. <laughs> I like the cowbell, so it's okay. You should uh, play that. I know a lot of people. I know it's it's really. Uh, I think it's closely uh, associated with like a lot a lot of Latin rhythms. But I mean, and the reason it is is because it's a very primitive instrument. You know, I mean that's what. And I consider myself a very primitive drummer. I'm not. I'm not a drummer. I'm more like a caveman that you handed two, two you know logs to. And I'm, <laughs> Anyway, I'm very appreciative, and uh, I'm, I stand by the cowbell parts in the album are, are, are good, and I'm looking forward to hearing what fans think about it, because I think, I think it's a real positive... Uh... Use them. <laughs> okay, Robert, thanks a lot for this interview. If you like, you can greet some friends now or say some last words to our listeners from Welcome to Hell. Well, you know what I would like to do? I would like to thank anyone and everyone who's ever supported the band or listened to us over the years, and I want to uh, say that We're heartbroken that we can't come out and play a lot of the shows that were planned, especially in Europe this year. I mean, it's just been a, a nightmare for everyone. But uh, we're going to try to stay strong, and we can't wait until we can see everyone again. And uh, my dream is uh, to get back up on stage and play Forever Black. And I think anyone that hears it on the album will be blown away because uh, our live performance of these songs will be that much better. Okay, great to hear that. Thank you very, very much, Robert. Thank you, Dirk.